Hi. Assalamualaikum. I salute you in an everyday greeting in my family because language is paramount to the discipline of typography. We are meeting one another today through Beatrice Wood's unimagined successor, this window that she didn't see coming, this Zoom thing. I'm Miriam and I fancy myself an ambassador of type or at least that's what I wrote in my admissions essay to my PhD program. Today, I'm going to take you on a rhetorical journey that will hopefully show you how we can use culture and family to reposition the worldview of graphic design and typography. In today's world of deal-making, deal-breaking, and sore losers, here's the deal. I call myself a lead learner surrounded by some brilliant students at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. There, I've been trying to adjust and adapt the way that I teach design and typography and switch up the resources we study in class to focus on delivering a more inclusive educational experience, one in which my students feel and see that they are part of the solution. A few weeks ago, I had my all-female typography students present with me at a type I. They showed a research project they've been working on this semester, which I assigned to them with the goal of amplifying their voices in this space. The project grew out of a class session when we looked at the work of underrepresented type designers. And my students pointedly remarked that one, these designers had to first justify their presence on stage. And two, as aggravating as it was, they felt there was nothing they could do to make a difference because they're students. As they say in reading circles, I then took a picture walk with my students through one of Louise Feely's books on collected signage. And I asked them how they'd feel about scrapping the original final project for the class, which was a type specimen sheet, and instead embarking on a different journey. One focused on the road less traveled within typography. The deliverable for the project would be to find and analyze typographic signage from distant destinations and put these together into a book and pursue publication. I wanted them to start their careers as published researchers and as authors and realize their own platform. In keeping with the compulsions of the new norms, all six of these students chose to take their classes online this fall. Online learning has expanded the worldview in our field and in order to find geographically dispersed signage, they did this project entirely on Google Maps using Street View, except for Sophia, who lives in Puerto Rico and was able to go out and photograph her own samples. But even Sophia used Google Maps at first to scout out her location so that she wouldn't have to spend too much time walking around San Juan in a pandemic. She found stunning historic examples of preserved signage from early colonial architecture, as well as vibrant typography that preserves and trumpets Puerto Rican heritage. And because she's bilingual, she harnessed that dimensionality to strengthen her research. This is Rachel, whose family is from both Germany and Norway. She collected type samples in a number of small towns in Germany. The thrill for her was finding volumes of black letter prevalent in older signage in those smaller towns where the street names and building facades and narrow alleys don't suffer from modernism, tourism, and urbanism. Here's Samantha who walked through Bogota in Colombia. She has a vested interest in Colombian culture and food because that's where her boyfriend and his family are from. So basically she roped her boyfriend into helping her do her typography homework. She used this project as an avenue to dig deeper into this culture that she's new to and has much respect for because of the people who are close to her. As she virtually strolled, or should I say scrolled, through the streets, she found elegant and decorative vernacular scripts hidden among the graffitied walls that speak of post-colonial residue. Kaylee, who is of Irish heritage and grew up celebrating Irish culture, was particularly excited to virtually revisit parts of Ireland that she's traveled to in person. 
She explored the metal type engraved at St. Patrick's Cathedral and even visited a few graveyards where she collected samples of lettering cast into headstones. She's using this project to celebrate the beauty of traditional Irish typography and as a way to strengthen her connection with her personal cultural upbringing. Skyla is the daughter of a travel agent and one of her favorite parts of this project was knowing that she might eventually go in person to see the signs that she found on Google Maps. She researched typography on the island of St. Croix in the US Virgin Islands and observed that the touristy locations she was able to access featured lots of modern sans serif type in direct contrast to the more traditional type styles that her classmates found in older cities. A salient point for her during this project was recognizing and owning both her privilege of being blessed enough to have traveled often and the privilege of countries where Google Street View actually works, where the Google cars have documented the routes and enabled access to this remarkable connecting technology. Victoria, because of her identity, is particularly interested in restoring and uplifting indigenous cultures. And she conducted her research project looking through areas of New Zealand, hoping to find evidence of typography with Maori influence. She said that, as expected, she mostly found evidence of colonial erasure. The signs she has collected for her book are contemporary neons and modern architectural sculptures. My students wrapped up that project this week. Final critique was yesterday. They decided to call the project the Wanda Type Project. And because of the intellectual property restrictions of selling imagery sourced from Google Maps, they agreed to build a website to house their research and share it with the world. It's still under development, but coming soon at wandatypeproject.com. In between leading my students to grab hold of the reins of their own future and recognize their enormous ability to impact the world from behind their screens, I work on a few other projects and I'll share some of them. Because of my wide ranging interests, my few other projects are very divergent. In fact, I was sort of told in a job interview earlier this year that because I was pursuing so many different angles, instead of having a focused research agenda that I could actually be perceived as a weaker candidate. I nodded and told, told them that I understood, but I was thinking in my head that if you all don't understand the need to hire people who are interested in exploiting the intersectionality of multimodal methodologies and a variety of perspectives, then you all haven't figured out the formula for success yet, and you all haven't been paying attention to what's going on in the world. Like my typography student, Victoria, I am also interested in indigenous design. In terms of scope, my research is focused on underrepresented designers. One study I did in 2019 looked at indigenous American designers who took the annual design census that's administered by AIGA. The paper investigates data from the 2017 design census and the study is quantitative. I used basic percentage frequency analysis. Quantitative data is not something you frequently see in graphic design journals. Statistical analyses are underrepresented as a methodology in our field. We've all heard the notion that people choose to go into creative fields because they can't do math. That idea actually goes way back to ancient Greek society and platonic works, which was when sensory learning was first discredited and non-sensory disciplines were prioritized. And this divisive and inaccurate bias perpetuates today the visual arts are not seen as serious disciplines like the sciences. There's this old but per pervasive right brain, left brain construct. But I like the way that Eva Bromberger referred to the ability to engage in both rational analytical thinking as well as perceptive and interpretive thinking as ambidexterity of thought. I'm pretty good at math. And I feel that's essential to say because it's not something you hear graphic desi designers say very often. Although I don't think you can really be an effective designer if you can't convert pixels to inches or calculate dimensions of pages or create proportionate grid systems. I'm not sure you can really do this job if you're not good at math. In fact, it's probably more accurate to say that a lot of designers go into this field because they are good at more than just math. If you're good at just math, you go into accounting or finance and you might see a lot of numbers in your career. But if you're good at 
more than just math. You go into a more complex and advanced field that requires ambidexterity of thought. And typographers, well, even more so. When you look at all the type designers who are driving this field into the next century by coding and programming type to reform itself according to the needs of the world, it's pretty surprising that more of us aren't publishing more quantitative and mixed methods research. We're still basing a lot of on academic knowledge on practitioners' law. But to be honest, if we're going to move forward, get everybody on this train, I see design shifting from completely qualitative to a mix of both qualitative and quantitative. And that might be a scary idea for some of us, but we need to. If students in a pandemic can collect and study historic typography in Colombia and New Zealand while stuck in their dorm rooms, then they need us to. Who are we to say no? What example would we be setting? We need to change the game. We need to get on the train. Anyway, I was telling you about my design census research. For this article, I looked at first designers who I defined as those US American designers who identify as Native American, First Nation, First People, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and those combined with these ethnicities. 264 of them took the 2017 design census. And their responses demonstrated that their leading concerns are diversity, representation, and ethics. Job level and income affect those concerns. The pay gap exists for non-binary and third gender designers, as well as for Native American designers. And first designers are underrepresented in AIGA. As I was doing this research, looking at all the data, of course, the complexities of identity, race, ethnicity, representation were front and center, as was my own unique Indo-Caribbean ethnicity. You know those forms we always have to fill out when we're trying to get a driver's license or apply for a job or the current US census? Look at this. These are the ethnicity options given on the primary source, which is the 1860 US census. If these were the options you were given, would you know which box to check? 1860 was the first year that Native Americans and first people were represented, as in had any semblance of a category on the US census. Indigenous Americans have been here for tens of thousands of years. But the first US census was done in 1790, which is only about 200 years ago. And the first time indigenous people were counted was in 1860, just 160 years ago. All these years kind of get abstract after a while and to contextualize the time span, I like to count years in units of grandmothers. <laughs> 160 years is three grandmothers away. 160 years ago, my grandmother's grandmother was alive. So it's pretty recent. That's the first time that indigenous people were counted in the US. In 1960, that's 60 years or one grandmother ago, these were the categories. Which would you have checked? Which would the first designers have checked? There's certainly no category there for me. My own Indo-Caribbean ethnicity does not exist in this primary source. This is the current census. We've made progress, but there are still problems with these categories. First Americans are still being bundled. People like me still have to go any, many, miny more when just pick whatever. I wonder what Kamala Harris puts on her forms. The question of significance is key to my research. Traditionally, social and cultural constructs have left out, marginalized people who we called minorities. Traditionally, the most stringent, validated, respected quantitative research methods eliminate the outliers from the analysis. We are the outliers and we have been neglected by research methods. Think about it, when less than 1% of the sample is Native American or LGBTQ or differently abled, those end up being the data points that get cleaned from the data set. And because of this, decisions have historically been made that do not consider our perspectives or our needs. We are left voided. 
fortunately today we are at the point where those we in the West used to call minorities are now the majority. And the new majority is bringing to light the extremely harmful effects of historical exclusion. This particular study is centered on the topic of ethics in design with a close look at underrepresented designers because it seems that we are the ones leading the growing responsible design movement, which is the idea that design and advertising should be executed with intentionality towards positive social outcomes. Diversity and inclusion has been trending in all industries for the last few years, including in graphic design. And after this summer, it's heated up and boiled over and a lot of institutions are facing the burn. A few years ago though, AIGA, the largest professional association for designers in the US, took a major step towards this goal with the help of Antoinette Carroll. AIGA administered the first ever design census in 2016. I know I was talking about the US census before, but don't mix them up. My research looks at the data from another primary source, the AIGA design census. The design census, which AIGA made open source, is probably the only comprehensive data set available to American designers that begins to provide substantial statistics on how this industry is made up. Before the design census, some of the last reported demographic statistics for the US design industry were from 2012. And they said that design was 86% white. So with the goal of examining the efforts of underrepresented designers within responsible design, I wanted to look at each different group within the graphic design industry. But the question I had to ask was, where do I start? I decided to start at the beginning. Who were the first graphic designers in North America? What are the critical issues that they care about? What are their ages, genders, education levels, their income levels, their job specialties? How many of these first designers are secure and thriving in the industry? My article reports the results of one of the initial steps in a study that applies or attempts to apply grounded theory methodology. This is an interpretive approach that was actually quite perfect for what I was attempting to do, which is to try to understand what the design census data revealed about these 264 first designers. I applied an inductive process based on grounded theories, emergence and constant comparative steps using this quantitative data set. The first step was to look at what the design census says about first designers. Subsequent steps will be to seek out other data sources and eventually try to elicit patterns and depth of understanding beyond common sense. But that wasn't the focus of this paper. This paper, as I said, was just an initial step. So I conducted three rounds of analysis to look at the critical issues affecting these designers, and I cross-referenced these with ethnicity, age, gender, salary level, job level, education level, job specialization, using percentage frequency analysis. The three top issues for the 264 first designers were diversity in design and tech, design not having a seat at the table, and ethics in design. Over 47% of first designers selected these issues. I compared the figure for ethics to the study of the same sample that I did in 2018, and I realized that designers of all other ethnicities all selected ethics at a lower rate than first designers. I also found that junior designers, who were the lowest earning designers, were more focused on education costs and equity of access, which makes sense with the younger age, lower income, lower job level. As expected, these designers were the most concerned with education costs and access and least able to afford it. Designers who earned between 150 to 200,000 a year and those in mid-level positions were the most likely to view ethics as a critical issue. In my 2018 study, I found a possible quantitative correlation between money and ethics, whereby designers of all ethnicities who earned more money were more likely to select design ethics as a critical issue. So this, this current finding provides additional support for the previous finding and reveals that first designers also need to attain a certain income level before ethics emerges as a primary issue affecting the design industry. But there are hidden variables at play here, since if you look at the chart on the right, you'll notice that as job level goes up, concern for ethics goes down. So more research on these underrepresented designers is necessary to understand. 
or is it just the vicious cycle? I also did a comparison between non-binary designers and all females and males who were millennials with bachelor's degrees in fairly stable full-time positions. And when controlling for these variables, interestingly, there was no pay gap between the male and female designers, but the non-binary or third gender designers had lower incomes by over $10,000. Those who identified as Native American, First Nation or First People, or as a combination of Native American, First Nation, First People and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander had the lowest average income out of all the first designers. The highest owners were the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander designers who made over $6,000 more than the next highest group. These designers were primarily involved in tech related fields like UX design, web design, interaction design, experience design, UI design, which are higher paying areas. So this could explain their higher incomes. The largest share of Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander designers were also in senior positions at their jobs, which also might have accounted for their higher average salaries except that so were the Native American First Nation First People. They were also in senior positions, but they made about $20,000 less. Other than area of specialization, none of the other design census variables offered any outright clues to indicate which variables might be contributing to the pay differences. So again, more research here is necessary. In this study, I also found that First designers who identified as either Native American First Nation First People or Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander or a combination of the two were much less likely to be AIGA members than those who were combined with another ethnicity. Out of the 60 designers who identified as fully first designers, only 23 of them were AIGA members. Now, it was a convenient sample of designers who participated in the AIGA design census. The respondents most likely would have heard of the census through affiliation with AIGA. So it can be reasonably expected that respondents would be AIGA members. Since most of them were not, barriers to AIGA membership likely exist for these first designers. AIGA, like most of the organizations, has recently undertaken a barrage of diversity and inclusion initiatives. So if the organization wishes to increase representation of these first designers in its membership, efforts to identify and eliminate those barriers would be necessary. So the end result of this initial research using grounded theory methodology to quantitatively examine first designers in responsible design is that given their heightened concerns about ethics, diversity and representation, these designers are quite likely at the forefront of the responsible design movement even more than other underrepresented designers. But a lot more work still needs to be done to not just understand their role in the design industry and their impact on the movement, but to acknowledge their contribution as leaders in responsible design. To do that, longitudinal investigations of these quantitative data sets coming from the design census each year need to be done. So that's the next project on my list. Working on this research made me have to dig a bit deeper into my own ethnicity story. I'm from Trinidad. I call myself Caribbean or a West Indian. I don't know what my ethnicity is. I am not indigenous to the Caribbean. My great great grandparents, that's three grandmothers ago, who were from India, were indentured to cane and to cocoa plantations on the island after it was clear that the world would no longer tolerate the enslavement of Africans. I grew up calling myself an Indian in terms of race or ethnicity, but I haven't been to India yet, and I don't think I should call myself Indian. I'm certainly not South Asian. To me, that's a geographic region, not an ethnicity. My husband is Indian, or Indian American now. He was born in India. His family is Indian. But his family wouldn't call me Indian, though, because although Trini food and culture still display strong Indian heritage, it's not the same as what they know as East Indian. West Indian doesn't really fit me either since the only reason they call it the West Indies is because some guy took a wrong turn in his boat somewhere in the Atlantic and to hide his geographically challenged mistake, he declared that what he had found was indeed India, just the Western version of it. <laughs> the other day, my brother sent the whole family this photo in our WhatsApp group chat. 
This is my five-year-old niece who's learning cursive writing in school. She wrote this story about that guy who got lost in the Atlantic. And in doing research for this talk, I came across it on my phone and it fits so perfectly in here, I had to include it. So time for a test. I believe that the chat feature in this conference platform is enabled. And I want to ask you all in the audience to decipher the story. I'll give you a minute. Look for the chat button in your Zoom controls. You should be able to type. And I want to see who in the audience can figure out this message. She wrote, Columbus sailed across the seas to Asia, but he didn't cross to Asia, he crossed to Cuba, but he bumped into some islands called Bahamas, which is actually where I was born. I don't know what I am. I am a modern product of a long history, exactly like everyone else. I am a person on a journey. I am from a yellow dirt road. I recently had the opportunity to work on the design of a book that attempts to tell the story of my forebears. It's a novel in my favorite genre, historical fiction, but this is one of the first pieces of literature that tells the story of Muslim indentured laborers from India who immigrated to Trinidad. And the book chronicles the dilution of their Indian culture and the evolution of their Trini culture over the span of four West Indian grandmothers. This book is particularly significant for three generations of Trinis. In the 1950s, when Beatrice Ward was shattering glass ceilings with crystal goblets, my grandfather was in Trinidad working for Apex oil fields. His job was to identify trees to be cut down to make room for the pumping jacks that would bring up the black gold from the Mahaika oil fields. He was probably one of the few Indian people in Trinidad who owned a camera at the time. And most people with cameras back then shot portraits of people and my grandfather took a lot of portraits, but he also photographed scenery. The photograph used for the cover of this book is part of his rare collection of black and white photos of the island that document the tropical landscapes at the crux of the industrial oil boom that modernized the country. Secondly, my mother is the author of this book. My mother was the first Muslim hijabi woman to preside as president of the Senate of a country in the Western Hemisphere. She's the one doing the hard work of researching the histories and crafting the rhetoric and finally telling this untold story. And thirdly, the grid system that the book cover is based on is what I presented at TypeCon last year. I refer to it as an anatomical grid and this is an unconventional approach to layouts that I've been working with for a couple of years now in my quest to go off grid and compose based on contextual and relevant grid structures rather than disassociated imposed ones. So the book is pretty important. Family is important. Family comes first. Family in the traditional sense is the group of people you become first acquainted with and in the more accepting sense, it's the group you grow or choose to be acquainted with first. And I'm actually going to tell you a little bit more about my family. And I'm gonna tell you about them through language. I speak English. <laughs> I accepted a faculty position at Nova Southeastern University this fall in the middle of the pandemic and starting a new job in a new state when nobody is physically on campus to show you where your classroom is has been an experience. <laughs> in job interviews, they like to ask you to talk about your weaknesses. If you ask my husband what my weakness is, he would probably say chocolate, but no, actually chocolate is my strength. My weakness is my first language. 
because it is my only language. My CV says rather boastfully that I have a basic understanding of French, Spanish, German, and I can read but not translate Arabic. But no, I really only just speak English. <laughs> and I feel so very limited. When I was a child though, my grandmother taught me to read and write Arabic. In fact, she taught my whole family to read Arabic. Some of us are better than others, but if you give us a straight line and all the vowels, we can read it. In prepping for this talk, I asked each person in my family to tell me how many languages they could speak, understand, read, or write. Now, everyone in my family speaks fluent English, but my husband and his whole family also speak Gujarati and Hindi. My husband's mother writes my cards in Gujarati. My brother-in-law and my sister-in-law both speak Urdu. My sister-in-law paints in Arabic and my mother can sing in Urdu. My sister, well, my sister had to send me a spreadsheet. My sister is also good at math and she makes spreadsheets for everything. Spreadsheets should actually be one of her languages too. And one month ago, she acquired a new language, Babel, which is the sounds that six month old babies make. Her husband speaks Korean. When I designed their wedding invitations and signage, language fluidity was a requirement for the design. All the text was set in both English and Korean because half the wedding guests were Korean. All of you here today probably speak multiple languages, so I invite you to share your languages in the chat because language is critical to repositioning the worldview of typography. One of my absolute favorite things in the world to listen to is people speaking multiple languages in one sentence, in the same sentence. When I taught in Dubai, my students would speak like 10 languages with one another, Hindi, Ukrainian, Farsi, Urdu, Arabic, Italian, English, and they all understood the basics of all these languages. In one single sentence, they would go in and out of multiple languages, juxtaposing phrases and conjunctions in the most amazingly fluid way. It's beautiful to hear. I went to a comedy show in Dubai once. <laughs> Have you ever been to a comedy show where you don't understand the language? You feel pretty funny because you don't think you'll get a single joke. You'll be the only one in the audience not laughing. But I could actually understand every one of the comedian's jokes because of my three word grasp of Arabic and because every fourth or fifth word was delivered or spoken in English. Plus he was very expressive with his gestures and his facial expressions and non-verbal communication. I remember being in a cafeteria in Richmond upon Thames and Americans like to call New York cosmopolitan, but New York has nothing on London. I was sitting at a table in Richmond eating and every table around me, there were conversations going on in a different language. No two tables spoke the same language and mine was the only English table. <laughs> My students at NSU now, half of them speak Spanish. I made it a point to encourage all of my bilingual graphic design students to write the content for their final project in two of their languages. For their final project, half of them are self-publishing children's books that they've written, illustrated, and designed. And the other half are designing and writing the content for a brochure for a nonprofit. This semester, I teach students who are fluent in Spanish, Italian, Mandarin, Cantonese, Korean, Indonesian, Russian, Japanese, Vietnamese, French, and ASL, American Sign Language. It's fantastic. And it's further illustration that English hasn't been the primary conveyor of ideas to younger generations for a while now. On top of that, for many of my students, there's no such thing as a first language either. For some decades now, kids have been growing up fluently weaving between two equal languages with no single language being dominant. They use different languages in different contexts, but their comfort level and frequency of use are equivalent. The terminology home language and ESL, English as a second language, no longer applies 
it's no longer a second language. It's two firsts. They have two first languages. At this point, you're probably wondering when I'm going to start talking about typography. <laughs> I assure you, I do take my role as an ambassador of type seriously. Academia usually separates typography and writing and rhetoric and language studies into different disciplines. But my MFA is in graphic design and my PhD is in communications. And like I was told in my job interview, my various research areas appear to be divergent. I'm trying to locate my research agenda in a very roundabout way. But I believe the trending term right now is intersectional. All forms of communication, including verbal, nonverbal, and visual, involve rhetoric. Rhetoric is an incredible socializing force that impacts people's ideas, actions, performance, and even political decisions. Rhetoric is the way that people frame their identities, highlight social issues, reinforce traditions and social contracts, and advocate for progressive ideologies. And meanings of connotative signifiers, such as visual rhetoric, are indeterminate since they are received by a socio-cultural mix of audiences. Like rhetoricians, designers construct messages. We design with the audience in mind and we curate factors such as emphasis and clarity. And we also have enormous power and responsibility in curating facts. In the same way that verbal rhetoric is planned and revised like spending hours preparing for a lecture, Visual elements need to be deliberately examined and controlled. Communication, whether it's verbal, visual, or nonverbal communication, these are parts of the same whole. But as you know, verbal, verbal communication has enjoyed much more attention in academic circles than visual communication. Visuals are understudied in the fields of journalism and mass communication, but visuals are key components in the communication process. The visual tone of a message affects perception in the same way that voice tone does. Visual messages are easier to convey, faster and easier to understand, especially by people with weaker educational backgrounds and more effective than textual messages. This is known as the picture superiority effect. Visuals carry higher activation potential than text and they have higher audience contact and retention. Because of this, visual communication has the potential to modify behaviors and attitudes. Visuals have significant agenda setting potential. I said I am an ambassador of type and ambassadors are political appointees. Studies in political communication have shown that campaign visuals tend to have priming effects, a concept derived from agenda setting theory where extra program factors are used to create emotional connections and these are used to persuade swing voters. In fact, there's been a lot of research showing that visually sound strategies in political com communication are particularly effective, and yet few political campaigns in history have actually concentrated on having a strong controlled visual strategy. Obama was one of the exceptional exceptions in 2008. Furthermore, although there are scholarly works on the impact of all these other media on politics, very few research studies have attempted to answer this question. What is the impact of typography on political communication? Typography and typesetting are by no means new technologies. Typography has been around since the beginning of writing. Typesetting has been around since the printing press and digital typography has been around since computers became popular in the 1980s. Yet the impact of typography and politics has been glaringly omitted from scholarly research. Despite the widespread media attention to Obama's visually driven campaign, hardly any research has analyzed whether typography had any impact on the perceived meanings of the campaign messages. As a text to be analyzed, typography is commonly overlooked. Invisible, as Ward said. There's also very little published research investigating the personas or personality attributes of typefaces. Instead, typeface personas and suitability have traditionally been intuitively divined based on generically assumed characteristics 
and designers' gut feelings. Designers did that with Gotham when Obama used it for his campaign, attributed all these flattering descriptors to the typeface without a shred of evidence, just designers' intuition. People describe typefaces by assigning human personality traits to them. The script is like charming, sophisticated, warm, friendly, scary. And as I have a communications background as well, and I've looked a lot at rhetoric, I wondered if we could flip the whole typeface persona thing around and get people to start describing humans with typographic characteristics. But now the roles of writer, typographer, producer, or publisher have fully converged and typography can no longer afford to be overlooked. Typography is as vital a component in the communication process as language. And because of the intersectionality, studying language means studying typography. Or should I say studying typography means studying language. And this brings me to the root of my argument, which is this question. When was the first time you studied typography? I want you to think about that. Most of you are designers or typographers. A lot of you will probably say that the first time you studied typography was in a tertiary educational environment, a university course. Many designers and typographers will think of their typography professor. In fact, a few weeks ago at ATIBI, I talked a little bit about my typography instructor from Howard University, Del Harad. Now, if you ask a regular person, someone in the street, someone who's not a designer or typographer, when was the first time they studied typography? They'd probably say, well, what's typography? <laughs> And you'd have to explain that typography is the study of how letters look and are formed and created to communicate a particular message. It's how some parts are thick or thin or some have horizontal bars and vertical strokes or two-story loops. It's how large a bowl should be or which letters have parts that ascend above the X height or below the baseline. And it's how you put all the letters together to form paragraphs of a message. And you can write it in traditional formal ways or you can focus on making it as legible as possible or sometimes you make the letters have a particular elegance or even a personality sometimes. And then the person would say, oh, well, I've never studied that. Typography is invisible to most regular people. Only a select few who studied it, perhaps around university, notice it. These are the craftsmen seeking the vintage of the human mind. I'm happy to say that my nieces and my nephew are such craftsmen. They are currently studying typography. And this fact is sheer magic to me. Let me tell you how that started. My mom and my two sisters and my husband went with me to TypeCon last year. I, like all designers, wanted them to understand what it is I do. I figured an academic conference would be the perfect forum to impart that understanding. At the end of the conference, when we were dividing up our swag bags, my younger sister said she wanted this particular poster with the Typecon Nice logo. I'm the only designer in my family. She had no understanding of typography before the conference. In fact, at the conference during Font Family Feud, she told me that the only typeface she could name was Hello Vetica. I couldn't figure out why on earth she wanted a poster with the Typecon logo. I was starting to form a critique in my head about her interior decorating choices when she said to us, this poster is perfect. I can teach Khadija and Ibrahim the alphabet with this poster. And I looked closer at the poster and I realized she was right. She was thinking of her toddlers. This was eye-opening for me. We all study typography as kids. In first year, my teacher was Dorothy Ragubar, and she called it penmanship class. Just the other day, my mother, who has now retired from politics and teaches high school language arts while writing her book, was commenting on her class typography. She said she preferred her students to turn in their homework as digital documents, and she felt bad for all the teachers back in the day who had to decipher their students' typography, except she was using the word handwriting. She said that in her school days, she lost marks for illegible writing and for not indenting her paragraphs correctly. 
Her teachers told her that she joined the letters in the wrong place. And that typography lesson has left an impression. 50 years later, my mother is still lamenting that she never learned to join her letters in the right place. And now that she's teaching high school kids over Microsoft Teams, she says that it's frustrating to have to grade handwritten homework. Handwritten homework gets graded last. We all study typography. As I said, my nieces and nephew are currently studying typography. Here's my niece practicing forming her ascenders and descenders. And here's my nephew learning which Arabic letters have how many dots. And here they are learning about baselines and X height. A lot of people would say that they first learned about typography in their late teens or early 20s in an undergraduate course at school. But actually, one of the earliest academic subjects every human with the privilege to receive a formal education studies is typography. We learn it in order to communicate and navigate the world. And the focus is exactly the same as it is in an undergraduate class, X height, legibility, analyzing the shape and structure and anatomy of the letter forms in order to determine what message they're communicating, the legibility. This is us as kids learning typography, learning, as Ward said, coherent expression of thought. Studies show that children whose parents curate print-rich environments from early childhood end up being smarter people. Children who are exposed to a lot of print learn to distinguish the forms and shapes of different letters and to copy them, and they are able to read and write faster, other things being equal, than children who are not exposed to a lot of print. There are two proposed models of how reading is learned, and both support the idea that typography has a distinct effect on the perception of a message. The feature-driven, exogenous, or bottom-up model says that in individual letters are understood first in a pattern recognition process before context and prior knowledge begin to affect comprehension. Legibility of a typeface affects the rate of pattern recognition. And then after that, visual context and design come into play to help understanding. On the other hand, according to the context-driven endogenous or top-down model, a foundation of prior knowledge informs as people read. Words are processed as a whole instead of letter by letter. Visual context and design cues are immediately recognized and processed parallel with verbal rhetoric. This is why people reading from meaning tend not to notice typographical errors. Regardless of which reading model is right, it's clear that at some point during reading comprehension, typography affects readers' perceptions and understanding of the message. When learning to write, toddlers in a print-rich environment quickly grasp directionality and top to bottom patterns of writing. They are also able to expertly tell you exactly what they've written, meaning that their brains make sense of their scribbles, which in the grown up world are mere doodles, which we all still practice at every level for some psychological need or the other, especially as designers. When my grandmother taught me Arabic, she was trying to teach me to read the Quran. And I never thought about this before, but the thing I paid the most attention to as a child, and the thing I notice most now when I very slowly read Arabic, is the typography. She'd be trying to teach me to read surahs, and I was fascinated by the ligatures, the connections, the shapes, the differences between Arabic letters and Latin ones, and the method of writing vowels above or below the consonants. She had no idea, but she was one of my first typography teachers. One of the first lessons every human studies is typography. And then we forget it. Instead of becoming crystal clear, it becomes invisible. The crystal goblet is an elegant description of type. It gives the impression of sophistication. But may I take the liberty to say it's sort of an elitist frame for typography? Not everyone enjoys wine. Not everyone has crystal. 
If you do have crystal, it's stored high up on the top shelf or in a cabinet that you only open once a year. And really, if the crystal goblet is the type, then wine must be the message. McLuhan disagreed, of course, he would have completely ignored the wine. And this crystalline idea contributes to the notion that typography is a rarely studied subject. Ward actually also referred to typography as a window. In fact, she described it as three different types of windows, but not as many people refer to that metaphor. It wasn't quite as elegant, it didn't smell as good. That modern metaphorical goblet was actually meant to be more decorative, more memorable as a metaphor and less functional. And that's part of the problem. The goblet is a fanciful idea, the unintended consequence of which is that it turns typography invisible. After kindergarten, nobody knows what that is. Hardly anyone understands its value or the worth of the people who study and design it. It's because we, we in the industry has, have framed it as an elitist, invisible, decorative, inaccessible thing. As a thing only appreciable by the rare vintage of the human mind. But it's not. It's studied and appreciated by everyone from early childhood. And everyone is graded on it from early on. And because of that, I say, maybe it's less crystal goblet and more a baby bottle. We have to think about who our audience is. If the message is wine, then the audience must be a very specific group of people. If the message is milk, we open up that metaphor to be more accessible to everyone, to regular people. What do we need as typographers, as designers, as educators? We already work with closed counters and closed loops. Do we need to continue in this closed-minded mindset? If you're trying to teach typography, your audience is probably not vintage. <laughs> They're probably a bit more variable. Everyone needs milk. And everyone relied upon effective delivery of that milk in order to grow smarter and stronger. The design of the baby bottle is critical. No one overlooks the design of the bottle. The design is all about function, the way that type is all about function. And just like type these days, baby bottles come in all kinds of experimental shapes and sizes to meet the varied needs of each particular user's whims and habits. Baby bottles are carefully designed with absolute precision, with focused attention to getting the milk to the baby. And that's what type designers do, absolute attention to delivering the message. Baby bottles are designed as vehicles, crystal goblets are vessels. They contain and elevate the liquid, but their design isn't really focused on delivery the way that typography is. There's a whole lot of unnecessary and decorative detail that goes into crystal goblets. To put it in contemporary terms, the crystal goblet is a singing telegram and the baby bottle is Amazon Prime. I'm not here to crack jokes or crack crystal or crack metaphors or put a crack in the crystal of Beatrice Ward's fragrant metaphor. I'm just here as an ambassador of type who is proposing that in Ward's day, the wine goblet metaphor delivered by an undeniably intelligent and eloquent female may have been exactly what typography needed to position itself as a worthy subject for that era. If Ward hadn't made that likeness, who knows, maybe none of us type nerds would be here. Well, actually, quite literally, because this lecture wouldn't have been named the Beatrice Ward Memorial Lecture. But the media landscape has rapidly evolved into that unimagined successor. And dominant cultures are dissipating, and first languages are an old idea. And despite the crystal goblet, most people still don't know what typography is, even though everyone studied it as kids. So maybe we need to reposition our field for success once again. Maybe it's time to get off that old steam train and hop on the Hyperloop. If we want adults to understand typography, then we need to shift the paradigm away from the concept that type is a grown up thing and declare that type is the absolute genome for absolutely all our reading ability 
and therefore all our understanding of the world and all of the footprint that we will leave behind. It is type that informs our toddlers and type that informed every one of us from entry into the very world that we now populate with the adult typography class in university. And just like smarter kids are those who learn in print rich environments, if we want smarter populations, we need to be studying and understanding type. At this point, you might be asking, but you said that we all study type from early on. So that should mean that we are already as smart as we need to be. Well, Ward called typography an essential humility of the mind and talked about designers who took wrong turns and failed miserably. But what if you replace the word designers with everyone? Without typography, everyone goes more hopelessly wrong, makes more ludicrous mistakes out of an excessive enthusiasm. Maybe since everybody understands what math is, and knows that they studied it, we need to do some quantitative research that shows that if you want people to stay smart, they need to continue learning about type instead of forgetting about it. Instead of crystal gobletting it, we need to remind people that they already know the basics. They're already familiar with typography. You know how people like to describe typefaces with personalities? What if typography was actually a person who walks around and lives in a house? What if we could talk to Mr. Typography? If only typography could speak. I actually went out to look for Mr. Typography. He was very, very hard to find. He is invisible, you see. But because I know typography very well, I found him. Hey, Mr. Typography, can I talk to you? Oh, you can see me? This is new. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm the ambassador of Type. I can see you. Oh, okay. I've been looking for you. I have this project that I'm working on and I was thinking of using some typography. Do you think you might have some time to sit down with me and see if you might be a good fit for the position? Sure, why not? All right, awesome. So, tell me a little bit about your strengths and your weaknesses. My strength? That's easy. It's invisibility. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I, can, I can see that. What about your weaknesses? That also happens to be invisibility. You see, it sucks being see-through. It's like I don't even have a seat at the table. Every time I go out to a restaurant to order some food, they always skip me by. Hmm, that must be pretty awful. What's your favorite food, by the way? Tacos. But my wife told me to say Thai. My husband told me after I rehearsed this lecture with him that he, for the first time, realized that he did study typography and that he used to know how to write in Gujarati. But because he stopped practicing it, he has now started to forget how to read and write that language. And that makes a lot more sense when you think about it from the stance of someone who forgets one language because they learn another. But it's the same idea. If you don't use it, you lose it. You forget the basic concepts of communication. You forget the necessity and impact of clarity and hierarchy and form and structure. If we want people to make smarter decisions, maybe typography should be taught throughout school the way that math and English and science are. Maybe the reason I studied typography in university was because once I became a teenager and forgot that I knew about typography, my grandmother pulled me back into Arabic classes. Every Saturday with my sister and my mother, we were reading Quran and studying Arabic typography. Typography is at the foundation of the design of verbal texts and verbal texts are at the foundation of language and both are found at the foundation of our human understanding. Typography cannot be thought of or seen or described or celebrated as invisible in an increasingly visual society. So I'm gonna wrap up this talk like this. 
There's a contemporary effort to democratize design, to get regular people to have a basic understanding of what design is, the way everyone has a basic understanding of biology or math or law, so that regular people begin to understand the value of design and how critical a role it plays in everyday life. In fact, when I decided to major in graphic design, there were a few years when my dad didn't quite get what it was I did. He's a doctor, like many fathers, it took him a minute. But you know what? In a delightful turn of unimagined events, my father told me three weeks ago that he has recently begun designing memes in PowerPoint. He puts together images and typography and get this, he makes a point to use multiple languages like Arabic and Korean in his designs. And he forwards these to his friends all over the world at 5 a.m. every day, except on days when he goes fishing. Now, you could follow up that democratization of design effort by extending it to typography, except that I think that maybe we've been going about it in reverse. Maybe the way to democratize design is to do it part by part. Start with reminding people that they already studied the parts, typography, color theory. It's probably a lot easier to democratize design by democratizing typography first. The reason that I made this extraordinary discovery that my father has started doing graphic design is because I told him I was going to give this talk. And I asked him what languages he spoke. And then I asked him when he first studied typography. And then I asked him who taught him to read and write English. And I told him that typography is how you form letters. It's knowing which parts are curvy and straight and how to join letters for legibility. It's what you learned in kindergarten. It's what you used to call penmanship. And he said, okay, I kind of get it, but I don't really remember the details or who taught me. It was when I further asked him who taught him to read and write Arabic. That's when my father really understood that he had in fact studied typography. His mind connected the formation of letter forms and placement of typographic anatomy much faster when he was able to consider the Latin characters next to his ability to read Arabic characters. He just never knew that it was typography he was studying. Knowing how to read a second language, not just a second language, but a second character set, helped my father understand typography. It sealed the deal. And if I can explain typography to my father, then everyone can. In this presentation, I've done something not many people would risk. I talked about and put pictures of all my family members in a professional lecture. I showed you my nibblings, my siblings, my parents, my grandparents, my husband. And because I've talked about everyone in my family, it means that everyone in my family who has no interest in typography is suddenly going to be interested in watching a one hour lecture on typography. In fact, half of them are here right now. I'm opening up the audience. As an industry, we can continue looking reflectively inward, swirling our ideas around and around. We can continue discussing typography in our tight knit exclusive circles, or we can open up the conversation to everyone and their grandmothers. Family is important. Where you come from is important. Your line, your heritage, your ancestry, your culture are most important. And we can use this family and culture and upbringing to remind people that they already know what typography is. In fact, every single one of my undergraduate students in doing the Wanda Type project, when given the task to thoughtfully select a location to base their research on, every one of their first choices was their place of birth or based on their early childhood experiences or their family's heritage. They connected their typographic interest to their early upbringing and to their families. Of course they did though, that's a normal expected thing to do, right? But the point is, such is the powerful influence of family and language and rhetoric that it provides us with an easy, easy way to bring to focus 
even something as obscure and invisible as type. Thank you. Crystal goblet. Look, we're drinking from a crystal goblet. And here I am. Look, we're drinking from crystal goblet. Auntie Miriam. My strength? That's easy. It's invisibility. I think I'm lying. I see. That's what you say. Yes, I see. And your weakness? Okay. <laughs> Alright, this is take two. One, two. You don't want me to say five and then have that in the video. How am I supposed to know what you're you, counting You towards? can count three, four, five in your own head. But I don't know if you're going up to three or four or five. Well, you can start whenever after three or four or five. 